Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're now three weeks into our back to school series asking the question, how am I going to grow this year? What is our plan for growing? Life is full of distractions and we need a plan if we're going to be growing as followers of Christ. So we're organizing this sermon series around the four banners behind me. We can read them together. Invite, connect, equip, and serve. Each week we've been considering what it looks like for us to do these actions. Now, how many of you have been to the pool at the club in Julington Creek? Julington Creek, how many of you have been there? So they have this giant slide there that our kids love to use, and they always want me or Colleen to go with them as well, which, of course, all I can think to myself is there is nobody here that wants to see a grown man go down this water slide. But I do it anyways because my kids want me to do that. I always feel like August is that point in the year that's like being at the top of the water slide and you're holding onto the bar and you're about to launch yourself down the slide and once your bottom hits that slide, you're gone. You're moving forward. There is no turning back. Momentum is going to take you through the twists and turns so you need to make sure that your drawstring is tied tight and your sunglasses are secure. Now, August is when we look at our schedules and the habits and whatever, do whatever we can to have a plan to grow. Many of us are already on that slide and the momentum is carrying us forward and we need to stop and think about, okay, what's our plan to be growing as followers of Jesus Christ as this fall takes off? This season of the year is a peak time for people checking out churches, and I know there are several of you here that are doing just that. And the first thing I want to say is what a privilege and honor it is for you to choose to spend this morning with us, so thank you for that. Amidst all the other things you could be doing, you are here worshiping with us, so thank you. Second, I hope that you can get a glimpse of what God is doing in the life of our church, and he is up to many things. Going back and listening to the first two weeks of the series from the last two weeks in combination with today and next week is a great way to learn more about us as a church. Now, I want to repeat a couple of things that were said earlier in the announcement video. The first is this. Mark your calendars for Sunday, September 10th. Sunday, September 10th. Because in a sense, that is the culmination of this little series we've been doing. That's our pop-up Sunday for kids' ministry when they move to new classes, new classrooms, new teachers. But it's also a pop-up Sunday for our adults as well. We want you to know how to grow and get plugged in here. So there will be booths set up in the courtyard with small groups, men's and women's ministries, Sunday school classes. We'll have our serve opportunities both here inside the church, how to serve, and also out in the community. It'll be all, all Sunday morning from 8.30 to noon. We'll still have both services, but it'll be available before and after the services. For kids and families, there will be inflatables. Maybe we need to have inflatables for adults, but that may get tricky. We will have themed breakfast snacks about popping up. I'm not going to tell you what those are. You'll have to wait and see, but they are sweet treats that you will certainly enjoy. But please keep this in mind. It is going to be out on the courtyard, which means what? That it's going to be hot. So it's going to be a casual Sunday. Wear something that you don't mind wearing out in the sun on the courtyard. Something that uh, you will enjoy being out there in. Wear your favorite t-shirt. We have tons of NPC t-shirts floating around this place. I'm not going to wear a robe in the first service. Certainly not a coat either. So please come out. It's going to be a fun day. It'll be a great way to learn how to get involved and how to grow. So the last two weeks, we've covered Invite and Connect. If you missed those, you can hear them on our website or go to Facebook or YouTube and catch up with those. And I want to make a few comments about those two topics, invite and connect, before we move forward. So last week, I posed a question to you that was posed to me by a friend, which was this. In the early church, when you invited somebody to go to church with you, what did that look like? Where were you going? You were inviting them to your living room into your homes. It wasn't just inviting people to come to a building. It wasn't inviting people to come to an event or a program, but it was inviting them into a relationship, into community. The church is not the building. Say that with me. 
The church is not the building. It's the people. You are the church. We are the church. When we leave this place, wherever God sends us, he goes with us. We are the church. And ultimately, we can't just be inviting people to come to a church building, but we need to invite them into our lives and invite them into relationship. So if we continue with the illustration about the house, it's like this. Inviting people to come to a worship service is like inviting them onto the front porch of your house. But ultimately, where life really happens is where? In the living room, when we're in deeper relationships with one another. Thinking about Connect, last week we talked about Connect. I've, I've had more than one comment about, so do you, are you going to talk about your shoes again this week? It was nice being able to use that illustration last week, but if I had a different pair of shoes to use for an illustration to every sermon, you would grow suspect of that, I think. So we talked about how we live in a culture where uh, true connection is incredibly difficult. Like there's so many challenges to it. Plus we live in this political and social era that has broken and fragmented so many relationships and pulled us apart. People are longing for meaningful connection. That's how God designed us. He designed us to be gathered around him in meaningful community. And as I said last week, Connecting at church is impossible to do if the only thing you do is come to worship. This is not a social space. This is a worship space. It is filled with extroverts and introverts. It is filled with joyful people and it's filled with grumpy people. Every church has some church curmudgeons, right? It's all of us gathered together here. We are fallible, imperfect people. But if we're wanting to connect in meaningful Christ-centered relationships with other people in the body of Christ, we have to commit beyond this hour. We have to go get it. But I don't want us to overthink it, and I don't want us to overcomplicate it. You don't need to be connected to everybody. That is impossible for any of us, including the pastor up here. But you need to be connected to somebody. That somebody, it can be two or three of you who gather together and pray for each other and encourage one another and do life. People who are also committed followers of Jesus. It could be in a small group or a Sunday school class. We have lots of opportunities to connect. Yesterday, as we said before, was the burger bash for our men's ministry. Next month is the burgers and bunco for women. Connect with people. Get involved in some of these opportunities. This fall, as we mentioned earlier, we're kicking off this small group series, a preaching series on the Sermon on the Mount called Different. Use this opportunity to join a small group or to do the study on your own. You can join one of the small groups that we currently have, or you can start your own. We have Sunday school classes that meet on Sunday morning. My wife even has a group for parents at 9 a.m. We have ways for you to connect. Just take the next step. Let us know how we can help you do that. Next month is our discovery class that is learning all about what it means to be a formal part of the church as a covenant partner, as someone who has covenanted to do life together. One more comment before we move on to equip, and that's this. Don't try to replicate past experiences. Don't try to replicate past experiences. I don't know how many of you are like the steps where you have moved here from different places, or perhaps you've checked out different churches, and have you ever found yourself wondering or trying to make current relationships or small groups or current churches feel like something you had in the past trying to replicate that experience that it almost becomes an obstacle to connect meaningfully because you keep trying to create something that you experienced a while ago so Colleen and I, we celebrate our 19th wedding anniversary this past week. We've been together a total of 21 years. And in those 21 years, we've been a part of six different church communities. And they have been in very different places. We met at a church in Berkeley, California. We were at a couple of churches, a few churches in Los Angeles, in Houston, Texas, and of course 
here in Jacksonville. Our community looked and felt different in all of those. We were in different stages of life. They were different places. It would be easy for us to rank them on a scale between incredibly fulfilling and incredibly awkward. Church communities can be so interesting at times, right? But as we look toward years ahead here in Mandarin, with you, we know we can't look back. Part of being the church, and it doesn't matter if you're sitting on the front pew like the Arnold's in the steps, or you're sitting on any other pew, part of being the church is coming to this community with an open heart and open hands and saying, okay, Lord, do what you want to do. Do something new. We're here because you've called us here. And I hope we understand that the pastors aren't the only ones who God calls to be at a church. Each of you is here because God has called you here. Each of you is here because God has drawn you in one way or another, whichever way he needed to, to take that next step of faith and involvement and being a part of his community. None of us are here by accident. You are not here by accident. So when we look back at past small groups, at past churches, at things, the way that God has moved, we need to be grateful for those. We need to be grateful for how God has encouraged our faith through others and cherish those friendships. But don't get so nostalgic. Don't get so enslaved to the past that you miss out on what God wants to do now. That you miss out on what God wants to do in this chapter of your life. So let's turn our attention now to the third banner behind me. What is it? Equip. Equip. The Oxford Languages Dictionary defines equip this way. It's to supply with the necessary items for a particular purpose. Many of us have been in back-to-school mode with our kids, and we need to make sure that they are prepared They're equipped that they have the necessary supplies that they need. Notebooks, textbooks, pencil cases, iPads. And then iPads just make things more complicated because then you have to figure out if they have the right apps on their iPad and who has access to the iPad and all those different things. The New Testament also talks about being equipped. Talks about being equipped to do good works, being equipped for service, being equipped or ready to give a defense of our faith of the hope that we have within us with gentleness and respect. On our website and in the lobby, you can read how we talk about being equipped. It says this, We believe we are called to align our lives with God's purposes. We will help each other discover our gifts and grow our faith to be equipped for service. So a couple of phrases that jump out at me from that. We are aligning our lives with God's purpose. So we're not trying to align God with our purpose. We're trying to align ourselves with his purposes. Uh, Another line that jumped out is being equipped for service. Discovering our gifts and growing our faith that we may be equipped to serve God and serve one another. So a word we like to use around churches is the word disciple. That's a familiar word. At its most basic definition, the biblical word disciple means a learner. It's a learner who follows a teacher. It is a follower who follows a leader. It's used over 275 times in the New Testament to describe what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's such an important word that we turned it into a verb. We turned it into a verb. We are people who are discipled and who disciple other people. So to be discipled is to be shaped and molded by someone or something. Uh, Like a, a mound of clay, if you think about that, being influenced by the potter, it's being shaped and formed. In the same way as disciples, we are being shaped and formed by the master potter to be more like Jesus. So our big question for this week that I have for us is this. Who is discipling you? Who is discipling you? It's another way of saying, how are you growing? Now, I tried to put enough things on that slide that all of you will be mad at me. There is opportunity for equal offense with this particular slide. Now, you're probably thinking, this is a dumb question. We're all here this morning because we are, we are disciples. We are followers of Jesus. But I want to push us a little bit on this topic. 
Back to that lump of clay. If you think about how we are all a lump of clay being shaped and molded by influences, there are so many forces at work in our world that are trying to shape us and mold us. There's so many different influences and people who buy their way into our lives in order to make us more like what they want us to be like. Our phones, they are indispensable, right? They capture our attention. They hold us captive and hold all our information and suck us in deeper and deeper. And then there are all these corporations and other things that purchase their way into our attention through our phone, through the apps. How many of you have heard the term doom scrolling before? Doom scrolling, doesn't that sound fun? Doom scrolling or doom serving, it is the act of spending an excessive amount of time reading large quantities of negative news online. So when you open up your phone and you look at it and you're scrolling through Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or whatever your, uh, whatever your poison is on your phone and you look up and realize, I've been doing this for 30 minutes. I've been doing this for 45 minutes or an hour. That is doom scrolling. It has captured your attention. It is influencing you one way or the other. Who is discipling you? Dare I say that politicians want to disciple you. A few years ago, or whether you're a fan of a Republican candidate or a Democrat one, they want you to follow him. They want you to put your hope behind them and spend your time and money with them. They want you to be their disciples, in a sense. Does your news outlet disciple you? A few years ago, I was talking to a pastor who was in a divided church who lamented that people were reflecting in their lives the tone and attitude of whatever the rhetoric was on their favorite news outlet. Who is discipling you? Parents, who are discipling your kids? Our brains, adults or children, are like sponges soaking up teaching and information. Who are they listening to? Who are they following? You see, the question is not whether or not you're being discipled, but it's who is discipling you. Who is discipling you? Now, we're all here because we want to be followers of Christ, and we are followers of Christ, but how do we make his voice louder than all the other voices? We're here because we want to be equipped to grow as disciples. We don't want to get sucked into the endless drama and hopeless pursuits of this world. So when we talk about discipleship at Mandarin Presbyterian Church and this idea of equipping, there are two words that I want you to write down and remember. Two words. Deeper and closer. Deeper and closer. We want to be a church that is moving deeper in God's word, we want to be a church that is moving closer to Jesus. You're probably thinking that is the most basic answer you could have given, Pastor, but let's probe into this. What does it mean to be going deeper in his word? So our passage this morning is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I'd like to invite you to read that passage with me on the screen. All scripture is God's breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the passage talks about both the origin and the purpose for the Bible. The origin, its source is who? God. It is God breathed. It is unlike any other book in human history. It is God's authoritative word for us. It is truth with a capital T. Have you ever heard the term red letter Christians before? Red letter Christians. So in 1899, a Bible was published with Jesus' words in red ink instead of black ink. And it was a way to accentuate Jesus' teaching. It, it was done out of a heart for lifting up the authority of Scripture and Jesus. However, in our culture, I feel that it's become an easy excuse to ignore the things we don't like with the simple justification well, I just believe in what's in red. I'm just a red letter Christian. We are not those people. 
We are not red letter people in this sense. And the only time we would be is if all the words in Scripture were in red. There's not a half that's about Jesus and a half of the Bible that's not. We can't just ignore one half of it. The entire Bible, both Testaments, are God's authoritative word for us, and Jesus is God incarnate. So at Mandarin Press, we want to hear God speak from the full counsel of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. That doesn't mean that we read all of it the same way. We do not read Leviticus the same way we read Matthew or Psalms the same way we read Acts, but they are all a part of this bottomless treasure trove of truth that God has given us. So we treat the whole Bible with reverence and humility. Not only is it God-breathed, but it is useful. The purpose of it from this passage is that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped. If we want to be equipped as servants of God, if we want to be equipped for every good work, if we want to be equipped for whatever might come our way, then we need to be in God's Word. We need to be allowing the Holy Spirit to mold us like that lump of clay through the promises and truth of Scripture. Romans 12 says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are renewing our mind when we are spending time in God's truth. We are renewing our mind when we're allowing Him to shape us and allowing Him to disciple us through His Word. So I want to give you a few practical ways to be in God's Word this fall. This is revolving around our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. The first thing is come to worship. Listen to the sermon. We're going to be digging into God's Word and digging into this most famous sermon that Jesus gave and if you miss Sunday, you can always rewatch the service, rewatch the sermon on Facebook, YouTube, or our website. The second thing is through a small group. Again, this doesn't have to be one of our formal small groups. You can start one. We have created a small group study guide that's going to match the sermon series so you can be in God's Word in community. And finally, being in God's Word through daily time. Daily devotion. So there are various ways to do this. You can read a lot or you can read a little, but the goal is to, have consi- is to be consistently reading the Bible. So one challenge I will have for us is to be reading the Sermon on the Mount. And particularly, I'm going to encourage us to try Scripture memorization. Now, some of you are overachievers, and you're going to try to memorize the whole thing. And I know a few of you have actually done this before, but for the rest of us, memorizing one verse out of the passage is a great way to allow it to shape us. Memorizing Scripture is a discipline that is undervalued. It is a discipline that is incredibly powerful. And to explain that, I'm going to connect it to our family's love language. In the step house, food is our love language. Is that true of anybody else's house? Anybody else's house? Food is our love language. Eating good food brings us joy. Cooking good food brings us joy. Sharing good food with friends brings us joy. Now, with few exceptions, good food takes time. Good food takes time. Now, a good grilled steak happens in minutes, but a good dry-aged steak That takes weeks, easily. How about bacon? Bacon only takes a couple of minutes to cook up, but it has to cure for days, if not weeks, to be ready for that. Now, you all know that barbecue is very close to my heart. If you want to smoke a brisket, you don't put it on the smoker for 20 minutes. It needs to be on there for at least 20 hours or more. Now, for those of you who like set it and forget it cooking, if you have the crock pot set, you can't just put the pot roast in there for five minutes and expect it to be done. It takes five hours. Is anybody hungry yet? Are we ready for lunch? It's the same thing with God's Word. If you're only spending a minute or five minutes in God's Word, we're not giving it the time to truly penetrate our lives. All those things take time. Good food takes time, and going deeper in discipleship takes time as well. I just can't simply do it in five minutes. 
Now, I'm not advocating for a standard of reading the Bible for four or five or ten hours a day, but memorizing Scripture is a way to let it sit in our hearts and linger. To continue the food metaphor, it's like letting our hearts marinate in God's Word. It gives it time to shape us and mold us. Think of all the time that we waste sitting at stoplights or waiting in lines or waiting for people. If we're memorizing Scripture, we can allow that Scripture to wash over our minds and move its way to our hearts so that God can deepen it. God can take it deeper and deeper in our hearts. How are you going deeper in God's Word? Now, can God use 30 seconds in the Bible to change our lives? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is five minutes in God's Word better than no minutes in God's Word? In God's Word? Exponentially. But there are seasons of our life and seasons of our faith when what we get out of it is proportional to what we put into it. How are you going deeper in God's Word. So that's one side of our equation here. The other side is to move closer to Jesus. Let's talk about that. So I want to talk about this in terms of two familiar images in the Bible, that of Jesus as a rabbi and Jesus as a shepherd. A rabbi is a Hebrew term that literally means my master. A disciple addressed their teacher in this way, addressed Jesus in this way, 16 times in the gospel. He was very clear that they saw him as their rabbi and they were his disciples. Rabbis had disciples. Jesus obviously had 12. And that relationship is critical to us understanding how we engage in our walk with Jesus. So the goal of a disciple was imitation to follow, to copy, to imitate, to duplicate their rabbi. It wasn't just about duplicating their teaching, but it was duplicating and imitating their life, how they prayed, how they served others, how they led, how they lived out their faith daily, and yes, how they taught. The Apostle Paul says, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. The Apostle John says, whoever says he abides in Jesus ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Disciples lived with their rabbi, traveled with their rabbi, ate their meals with them, and walked with them along the roads as they traveled around ancient Israel. That's that's how you learn how to imitate someone. You spend time with them. You go deep with them. Life on life. Hence, when Jesus tells his disciples to come and follow me, he was inviting them on a three-year mission trip with him. He was inviting them on this three-year mission trip to learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So there was this phrase used as a blessing that dates back to the second century before Jesus that essentially said this, may you be covered with the dust from your rabbi's feet. May you be covered with the dust from your rabbi's feet. The idea there is that you are sticking so close to your rabbi that you are literally wearing the dust from his sandals, that it's being kicked up around you as you walk behind them on those dusty roads, and you are wearing it. It means that when you are sitting at the rabbi's feet, listening and being taught, that you are sitting in their dust. And so you're not just being sprinkled with truth and with teaching and with the rabbi's life. I mean, you are literally wearing the rabbi's dust. So as disciples, we want to be as close as we can be to Jesus. To use another image, that of a sheep and a shepherd. A shepherd feeds, protects, and guides his sheep. A sheep on his own can't do any of that. And I love this quote from A.W. Tozer. The only safe place for sheep is by the side of the shepherd. Because the devil does not fear sheep. He fears the shepherd. The devil, and we do believe in the devil, does not fear sheep. He just fears the shepherd. So we want to be as close to the shepherd as we can get. We want to draw closer and closer to him every day. 
One of my favorite psalms is the 73rd Psalm. It's a testimony. It's a testimony about a guy whose life is falling apart because he's looking around at the wicked, looking around at what evil is going on in the world and saying evil always wins, the wicked always win, the wealthy always win, and they mock you and they mock me for following you. But he gets into worship and God reorients him around the truth of Scripture and he closes it with these verses. He says this, For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. I love that. But as for me... It is good to be near God. So of all those things in the world that want you to draw close to them, of all those things in the world that want you to place your hope in them, your love in them, and invest yourself in them, the psalmist declares it so well, it is good to be near God. Being close to Him is better than anything else this world has to offer. In the spring, we talked a lot about momentum. We want to be a church that has momentum. We want to be a church that is growing. Do you remember what our equation for that was? That if every person in our church is taking one step per week toward Jesus, we have unbelievable momentum. If every single one of us in the church are taking one step closer to Jesus each week, just one step, not a hundred steps, One step per week, we will have incredible momentum. And as a pastor, that's the church that I want us to be. As a disciple of Jesus, that's the disciple that I want to be. And I hope that you do as well, that we would be a church that is filled with people who are moving closer to Jesus week by week. We want to be a growing church. We want to be a church with momentum, but not in an in an egocentric MPC way, we want to see people worshiping Jesus who were not because he is the hero of our story. He's the one who can transform our lives from the inside out. We want people to be drawn to the beauty of Jesus and the beauty of his work through this gathering of imperfect people, through this community. So how will we grow? Why would someone who does not worship at MPC want to come here? You may disagree, but for me, more than any program or event, more than any pastor or worship team, people will be drawn to our church because our lives are being changed by Jesus. Specifically, your life and my life. They'll want to come here because they experience Jesus and we are experiencing Jesus. If our lives are not being changed, if we're not becoming more like Jesus, then any effort we have to draw people will be futile. We don't want people to come here because we are attractive or successful or better than other people or other churches. We don't want people to come here because they like our political opinions or our social stances. They generally won't. We don't want them here because of the pastors or the music. None of that will be sufficient. We want people drawn here because of what Jesus is doing in our midst. We want people here because of the fruit of changed lives. Because of those moments when they run into you at your office or at school when they experience something significant going on in your life that can only come from an all-powerful Savior God changing you from the inside out. So what does it look like to be equipped as a disciple at Mandarin Prez? How do we grow at Mandarin Prez? These are our two cornerstones. We want to be going deeper in God's Word and closer to Jesus. We want to be going deeper in God's Word and allowing it to penetrate our hearts. We want to get it as close to Jesus as we can, to be a church that is filled with people who are taking one step closer to Jesus. One step closer to Jesus every week. There are opportunities to do that. There are opportunities to be growing in our faith, to be growing deeper in God's word, and to be growing closer to Jesus. 
But the key is, take the next step. We said it last week too. Take the next step. Look at the different things going on. Consider how God may be provoking you from the inside out to take steps closer to Him or take steps deeper in His Word and take the next step. We as your pastors, the staff, are here to come alongside you and help make that happen. We're just a phone call or an email away and we would love to help you grow. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for your incredible patience. We thank you for your incredible love for us and that you shepherd us along the journey of faith uh, through the peaks and through the valleys, even though like sheep we may wander, we may stumble from time to time. You're right there with us and you pick us up. You scoop us up, you stand us up on our feet and you continue to lead us to feed us, to guide us, to protect us. Lord, we want to get as close to you as we can be. Help us to be deeper in your word, to be deeper in your truth, and allowing it to shape us and transform us. And Lord, we pray that we would be a church. We would be a church that lifts up the name of Jesus. A church where our lives are transformed first. And others experience what you are doing in our lives and they want to come together and worship you and have their lives changed as well. Lord, that only comes by your hand and by your spirit. But we pray, Lord, that your blessing would be on us as we continue to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand and let us sing together.